This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. Imagine if we had the transcript of the collective unconscious of an entire society. If you were a scholar interested in understanding that society, I think you would be very interested in studying that transcript. This is what I've been saying for years and years to my students in regular universities and at Renegade University. Pornography, which now is consumed by virtually everyone in American society, is that transcript of the collective unconscious, I believe. My guest this week was the first academic scholar to take seriously this genre, this art form, this very popular culture that is simultaneously everywhere and nowhere. This is my interview with Linda Williams. So I'm in the house uh, in the Berkeley, sort of lower hills, I guess you would say, of Linda Williams, a pioneer in, I think, and many people think, in academia for reasons we will discuss, and a hero to many of us in academia who chose to take paths that at the time were considered to be dangerous and wrong. So I'm really, I'm, I'm sort of honored to be here, actually, and I'm really grateful that you would have me here and to be willing to speak on unregistered. A lot of, I told you just before we started rolling that a lot of academics are very skittish about coming on this show, but you said you had no problem with it, which I appreciate. So thank you for doing this. Well, I'm happy to. And, and as I said, I think I have nothing to lose. <laughs> we'll see. Are they going to fire me? That's right. You have tenure, right? <laughs> and you're an emeritus. So yeah. So let's, let's do this. I thought the best way to do this for the audience, many of whom probably will not know about your work, um, is do, let's do the sort of what the headline would be uh, of the capsule summary of your career. I mean, you like most famously, right? You're f most famous for essentially pioneering what is now called porn studies, a term you don't even like. Right. <laughs> but the, the study of pornography um, as a serious object of academic study, mm -hmm. right? You were That's the, true. You were essentially the first, I believe, academic to do that, correct? Well, I'm the first person to take it seriously as a form that needed to be paid attention to. Right. I think that that would be fair to say. And you treated it at, in your work the way that an English professor would write about a novel. Exactly. Right. Yes. That's, that's what you did that mm -hmm. no one else had done before. There were, of course, there was academic talk about pornography, but it was as to how bad it was and how dangerous it was and, and or whether it should be censored. Well, there were some people like Stephen Marcus. Mm -hmm. He wrote a pretty serious book about, it wasn't about film pornography, but it was about pornography. Mm -hmm. But I, I always felt that he was holding his nose. It, oh, yeah. He didn't... He's anti-porn, isn't he? he? Well... He came off as anti-porn, but that was sort of the way one had to be because it wasn't art. That's right. For him, it wasn't art. Right. And that was the question. And as a literary scholar, he could do that. Right. Uh, as a film scholar, I found it to be a genre. Mm -hmm. And genres are of intrinsic interest yeah. to us, who to those of us who care about genres. But the thing is, Linda, what, you chose a completely insignificant art form because no one watches porn. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, this, was, this is the great sort of what I like to call bourgeois silence that you just, mm -hmm. you just threw open the doors on, right? It's like everybody does this thing and no one talks about it. 
Right, right. right. And not, it, in, it not in any went, serious way. It went without saying yeah. that uh, it was uh, trash. Mm-hmm. And, and interestingly enough, in fact, I've just been trying to work on this idea. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to write an essay about the the supposed end of obscenity mm-hmm. that you know that there was this belief in the uh, right about the time someone like Stephen Marcus was writing or into the early sixties that uh, that uh, obscenity was going to disappear because we were going to be able to say because there were all these things that were that were that were deemed obscene that that were no longer there was a, a, a sea change happening mm-hmm. but what with sexual revolution and cultural revolutions and and all of a sudden lady chatterley's lover was not was not obs- obscene mm-hmm. uh, and along with lady chatterley's lover it became possible to say that um uh these other things that were obscene were were maybe okay too and so there was this legal idea that one could develop the hard core. And mm-hmm. once you identified the hard core, mm. uh, then, then you, you found that bad thing that was at the center that you could spit out. Mm. And all these other things could come in. But as that was happening, the very definition of, of, of uh, sexuality was changing. It was becoming... Uh, an important force, right. something that we needed to not repress as badly as mm-hmm. we had in the because sexual revolution was taking place. Yeah. And so, as we were trying to pare down the hardcore, and that's the language of Walter Kendrick, which oh, yeah. is I think a oh, real, oh, in the a Secret really, Museum, yeah, a, re- the, the, a really interesting a book, great, a great book. Uh, it's called The Secret Museum. It's a history of pornography. And I would yeah. say it was a book that enabled my book. Yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't have written it without without yeah. Kendrick. So this idea of a hard core, but at the same time, the hard core was kind of melting in front of our very eyes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, if sex was important, then obviously pornography was important that's to what, study. That's what I've always been saying. You know, I mean, <laughs> psychologists for how long have been telling us that sex and sexuality is at the center of our unconscious mind and at yes. the center of our consciousness I mean, as well? That, that was what Freud said, and certainly. That's right. Freud and, and however many ever other psychoanalysts of all kinds, right, have mm-hmm. been saying this forever and ever. We all sort of know this in some way or another, right? <laughs> and yet we never talk about it. It, and we never and with pornography and we have the statistics now I don't know if you've heard have you heard John Ronson's podcast on Pornhub it's absolutely fantastic no you need to listen to this is it about Pornhub yes it's about Pornhub and it's effects on the industry it's you need to listen to this well if you give me a uh, recording of what we're making I won't take notes uh, thank you I will tell you I will tell you later <laughs> I will remind you I promise you um, but he uh, one of the great moments in it is the the president of Pornhub says well it's funny how much Americans, you know, complain about Pornhub and they always try to censor us and they're always talking about censoring our our actors when in fact we we know how many Americans are watching Pornhub. <laughs> They've uh, got the it's stats. 165 million people per day in America, <laughs> which accounts for every single adult American. <laughs> so that means <laughs> that essentially virtually every American is, is watching a, a Pornhub every single day. <laughs> and yet no one's talking about it, right? Mm-hmm. And certainly in academia. So when I entered graduate school in 1991 there was oh. there was no such thing really mm-hmm. i mean that it was it was unheard of i mean not just porn i'm talking about sex we didn't talk about sex you know um and i that was one of the reasons i left was because i needed to talk about sex <laughs> <laughs> because i thought it was important uh not because i'm a pervert you know although that's part of it but you know it's uh <laughs> It's a remarkable thing, isn't it? I call it the mm-hmm. great bourgeois silence. I don't know if I coined that, but you know, this is mm-hmm. basically what Freud talked about, just repression. Yes. You know, that we just yes. don't talk about yes. it from the Victorian era. Mm-hmm. Like and so here you come, uh we're kind of jumping ahead of here, but like in nineteen eighty nine you publish Hardcore, which is your most famous work probably, and that's the pioneering work where you take seriously porn mm-hmm. as a film genre as it's an object of study. Um and uh at that eighty nine, I mean that was really what was it like? I mean, you, you enter that world. You do talk about it in your book a bit, but describe it. Like, what was it like to do this at that time when no one was not only talking about porn, but not talking about sex in academia? Well, people were talking about sex because absolutely Freud had mm. had paved the way. And, mm. it, you know, I was reading, I was reading at that time, I had 
already written a book on surrealism. Mm -hmm. And why was I interested in surrealism? Mm -hmm. It was fascinated by sex. Mm -hmm. It was fascinated by the return of the repressed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was kind of primed to do this, not not thinking that, but but I, I had been studying Lacan. Mm -hmm. uh, Lacan had actually been a surrealist. Um, and was interested in the absurdity before he became a more serious psychoanalyst. He was, he was, he, he was, he, what was it? He received Salvador Dali uh, in his apartment. Maybe it was Dali who received him. Anyway, mm -hmm. they met. And one of them had a piece of cigarette paper that was glued to his nose, just as a kind of gesture of absurdity. Uh -huh. um, so uh, I took very seriously the notion that the surrealists were uh, interested in, in, in libido, interested mm. in the, the return of the repressed. And I, I seriously studied psychoanalysis because I was doing this at a time when psychoanalysis was sort of taking over the academy mm -hmm. and seemed to be the, as Freud would say, the royal road to the unconscious, mm -hmm. to the structural foundations of our very being. So I think I was primed by the time I turned to pornography. The real question is why I turned to pornography. Absolutely. I think I, it was some kind of <laughs> naivete at that time. Yeah. Uh, it, it just, it, well, it's because I was becoming a film scholar. Uh -huh. And, and well, frankly, uh, I would have loved to have been the film scholar who wrote the book on Hollywood musicals, but that had already been mm. written. And, and I, my insight was that it was possible to talk about Hollywood musicals and to talk about the numbers in Hollywood musicals, which are those moments when you move from dialogue and speech into song and dance. Right. And I always loved those moments. Mm -hmm. I know some pe those people who hate musicals hate mm -hmm. those moments. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really loved that transition mm -hmm. from one register into another register. Yeah. And I realized that this was my route into being able to talk about pornography in some kind of structural or structured, structured. way mm -hmm. that that there was something to be said about the relation between the narrative and the number uh, and what is the, the the narrative might present some kind of problem that a couple is having um, and then the and then the number would solve that problem and that there was a kind of work being done by the pornography that I was looking at at that time which was of the um, uh, the mid 80s well actually I was looking at the history from from Deep Throat right. from 72 yep. that that I mean what was Deep Throat is about solving the problem of a woman unable to achieve orgasm mm -hmm. uh, and so I realized that there was there was a, a, di a dynamic between the problem presented in the narrative and then the solution that was offered by the great sex mm. uh, that would happen. And once I had that insight coming from musicals, <laughs> um, I realized I could, I could write about the sexual numbers in a way that would make sense, that would, s would be able to explain what work was being done of solving the problem solving attempting to solve the problem or or assuming to solve the problem or ostensibly solving the problem yes i mean yeah. deep throat is a is a yes. silly absurd. joke right. but yeah. but nevertheless that was that was huh. that was the game that was being played but but when porn i mean the common one of the common criticisms of it is that there is no narrative or not enough narrative that it's just slam bam you know it's just right to the sex but it isn't. Okay. I, mean, I mean, that's why looking at the history of pornography was actually useful. So I went to the Kinsey Institute and I looked mm -hmm. at the previous pornography that everyone had kind of ignored, mm -hmm. the stag films, which only kind of uh, jokey men had written about. Uh, and and it, it not only, it, and they weren't holding their nose, they were kind of laughing at it in a guy way. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's do that. I would love for you, I mean, the audience would love to hear you 
sort of walk us through, if you don't mind, walking us through the history of pornography, because that's what you do a lot in your book, mostly your book uh, mm -hmm. in hardcore. That's what you do. You yeah. kind of start from the beginning and go through the 20th century. So yeah, talk about that in Stag Films. It's sort of mm -hmm. phenomenal, phenomenal phenomenon that you, <laughs> that you discovered. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, so I took, I took the genre seriously, uh -huh. and I realized that people had opinions about about pornography, but they didn't have much history mm. because no one had actually written any serious history. And I didn't write a serious, I mean, I didn't write a history. I, I wrote... Well, it's not, it's not a comprehensive, you're not attempting but, to be a comprehensive history. But I did take, history. you know, yeah. from the moment of the invention of cinema, and I didn't really look be, be, uh, before that. Mm -hmm. But what was the invention of, of cinema, and and what was the uh, the pleasure of movement, and the the discovery of movement, the explosion of movement, and so I, I I just tried to reconcile what I thought cinema was with what pornography was, mm -hmm. and to see that pornography was part of cinema, mm -hmm. and that was an important thing to say mm -hmm. because there was this tendency to want to ejected as the hardcore. Mm -hmm. um, but this process that I mentioned earlier in which the hardcore kind of melts in front of your eyes and you realize that maybe there isn't a hardcore, um, mm -hmm. at least that was the, 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 the problem I was presenting in this book called hardcore. Right. What is the hardcore? So definitely in an era of obscenity, uh, stag films were the hardcore they were obscene they were illegal nobody was supposed to see them if they did it was an illegal act describe them um uh black and white uh 10 to 15 minutes max silent films in which people who if you see them today they could be your great 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 grandparents mm -hmm. God forbid. um uh have uh uh, there's a little bit of narrative. Uh, the plumber arrives. The pipes are are uh, clogged, and the plumber gets turned on. the The woman who is concerned about her pipes gets them cleaned, um, and uh, uh, one or two sexual acts take place in which you see close ups of erect penises. Penetration. Uh, you see uh, spread legs. You see all of the things that precisely you were not allowed to see, mm -hmm. and that no one was allowed to see legally in those days. It, it was obscene, obscene. But they don't finish. Is that right? They don't show the end. They don't. Well, they don't show the climax, the orgasm. Yes. Well, is that right? what, is, what is the end? I mean, what yeah, is yeah, yeah. the end of a sexual act? Good, good question. Yeah. Um, we are, but they did not, right? They did not show the ejaculation. Sometimes they or, did. Sometimes oh, they, they okay, didn't. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I may have simplified that a little too much in the book. I mean, there, there are definitely uh, visible orgasms. Okay. Uh, I've never seen a stag film. Yeah. Never. I don't think so. Mm -mm. Oh. I'm all too young. Well, I mean, I'm when not, did they? When did they die out? I mean, uh, they died out with Deep Throat. I mean, they were still oh, yeah. going strong. Uh, yeah. in, in the in the late 60s yeah well, even but where they added a little color but they they were they were not sound it was just this idea that all you need to show is the kind of sex that you haven't seen before mm -hmm. and and you don't need to do anything more because that's what has been missing that's what has been obscene mm -hmm. and so you show the obscenity right uh, and so stag films are I mean, first of all they were they were shown in stag parties mm -hmm. in the United States. In Europe, it was different. Uh, this this is something I've learned more recently, and I didn't do a good job with Europe, but I didn't even try to do a job with Europe in, in the book. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it was uh, brothels, for mm -hmm. the most part. Mm -hmm. France, Italy, places like that. Um, brothels were quasi-legal. They were uh, permitted, mm -hmm. frowned upon, but permitted. And it was kind kind of normal for, let's say, an uncle to take a nephew to the to a, a brothel to initiate him into into sex. And they would show the movies uh, to kind of 
arouse people. Mm-hmm. Whereas the stag parties, they might invite women. Uh, so if you were invited to a stag party, you were, by definition, the audience for a stag film. But normal women were not part of that audience. And so these were films that were made only for men. Men, right. And for these, and they were illicit and and, and underground and illegal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, I mean, my fa- I think my father told me about going to stag parties and watching these films. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I sort of remember that. It was a kind of rite of passage yes. for most men. That's right. Yeah, it's something mm-hmm. they would never forget. I think. Yes. Right. Yes. And so, what? Um, I mean, what do you make of that history? And what do you make of that art form? Well, for me, the interesting thing was that it changed. Why did mm. it change? Why why did this film called Deep Throat, and which was not the only one, but it was the one that everyone talked about mm-hmm. because it was so outrageous. Mm-hmm. Why did this film called Deep Throat suddenly show, become feature length with sound, and why did it uh, concentrate on what I be- came to call the money shot, which is the the visible ejaculation on the part of the penis, mm-hmm. uh, which would therefore define the end of the sex. Like when you earlier said, well, the stag films didn't end. Mm. They, they, because we're so used to the climax being the visible evidence of the, of the satisfaction of the sex act. Uh, well, is that necessarily the climax for the woman? No. Mm-hmm. So, so, uh, but there wasn't any concern in the stag film okay. about the woman's pleasure. Okay. Yep. And yet, and to me the really extraordinary thing, much as one does not admire Deep Throat, is the fact that it was deeply concerned about the woman's pleasure. That was the problem it was solving. Yes, exactly. That's right. We have a number of new courses and new instructors being added to Renegade University every week. Right now, you can take courses on postmodernism, the philosophy of Nietzsche, the politics of sex work, and my courses on the history of race in America, and a renegade history of the United States. Soon, we will be adding Daniele Bolelli's History of Martial Arts and Tom Nichols' An Instructional Design for Dying. We also have courses on American foreign policy and American history. To become a member of Renegade University and have access to any of these courses, as well as to The Quad, our own social media platform, and Office Hours, a chance to talk to any of our instructors via teleconferencing, go to renegadeuniversity.com and join. And on April 24th, 25th, and 26th, we'll all be convening at a Renegade University weekend, this time in Oakland and San Francisco, California, with a special guest, Daniel Coffeen, a star of Unregistered and one of RU's most popular faculty members. For more information and to buy tickets to the Renegade University Weekend in Oakland and San Francisco with me and Daniel Coffeen, go to renegadeuniversity.com slash live. Some people don't know about Deep Throat, by the way. You know, uh-huh. my audience yes. is probably too young. So you want to talk about the, the plot of Deep Throat? <laughs> yes. And by the way, do you know the great documentary about it? The What's it called? I'm in it. Are you? Yes. Oh, that's, oh, that's right. I'm my, one of the talking My heads. friends made that movie. So actually, yeah, I remember, I, that's one of the... Re- oh. Uh, Fenton and Fenton and Fenton. Randy. Yeah, the yes. World of Wonder. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. The, yeah, I love they, those guys. In fact, they filmed me in this very house. Oh, good. Yeah, that's okay. I, did, I must have seen you then. Yeah, that's right. Uh, one of the, my other exposures to you. Yeah, they're great. You know, these are the people who discovered RuPaul and yes. are the producers of RuPa- RuPaul's Drag Race, uh-huh, Fenton uh-huh. Bailey, Randy Barbato of World of Wonder Productions. They were the first people to option my book, as a matter of fact. Is that right? They were going to make a renegade history of the United States TV show. And they never did. It just didn't happen. Not because of them, but yeah, because of the because uh-huh. of Hollywood. But we have done other projects with them. I've been on uh-huh. a lot of their shows too. As a talking, yeah, those no, are great guys, and it's a, I think it's a great film. Did you like it? I mean, did you? no, I'm I'm happy with it. Yeah. I, I don't like what I wore. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're I think you wore it was great. Whatever you wore. Um, so um, the cultural significance of that movie was immense, you know, and it was it was playing in, I think just almost every medium to large city in the country it was yes in fact i uh, in in a subsequent book called screening sex Mm -hmm. i write about what it was like to go see it Mm -hmm. uh uh in the uh in the 
it was probably wasn't 72 is because i was in the provinces i was in denver mm. uh we, but we we got up a little party and went to see it and it was like an experience and i compare that to the experience of seeing last tango uh which was also oh. an experience yeah. that that, that moved people uh, 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 you would call it a nearly pornographic film i would say last tango in paris yes yeah yeah yes. Right. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so t- so tell me about the experience of seeing deep throat uh-huh. in 1972 uh <laughs> let me first tell you about <laughs> deep throat yes please um because the experience of pornography prior to deep throat was for the mo- i mean there are other important films that changed but deep throat was the one that everybody saw and it was kind of obligatory to mm-hmm. see you mm. felt if you were oh really if you were hip a sophisticated hip person huh. in the early 70s of someone who was in some way experiencing sexual revolution uh-huh. uh, I was in fact married and all of that but uh, but I, I felt part of the sexual revolution because I had had birth control pills mm. early and and felt like I was liberated from uh, the usual kind of fear of pregnancy. Mm. Um, so um, uh, when one went to see this film in order to see hardcore explicit sex and what was the experience that it gave you? It gave you a variety of sexual positions. It gave you uh, a lot of fellatio because that was narratively justified, motivated, you might say, by mm-hmm. the fact that the 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 doctor in the uh, in the film uh, diagnosed the patient Linda Loveless as someone who had uh, her clitoris in her throat. Mm-hmm. Therefore, the the miracle was that it was possible to see more of sex with fellatio uh, because there you get you get an expressive face mm. uh, that could smile, that can swallow, that can do all of these things, and you get an expressive penis, which will do its thing. Mm-hmm. It's more than penetration. In fact, fellatio became all the rage. It was mm. if it was a new, a mm. new sex, as if, as if it hadn't existed it, from time immemorial. <laughs> I believe that oral sex was in the DSM until the 1960s as a pathology. As, exactly. I, it, exactly. It was, yeah, mm-hmm. right. No, right. And there are Along the, with homosexuality. Right, yeah. and there are these trials, a lot of trials, of obscenity trials mm-hmm. of deep throat in city after city, especially in New York, where it had a particularly important impact, um, where the judge in the trial... It's really obvious that he learned about fellatio for the first time uh, from the sexologists who were asked to testify. And so this is the, 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 the tradition of speaking sex that I like to talk about, that sex became speakable, yeah. um, that everyone was talking about this new thing as if they had invented it, as right. if it didn't exist before. But in fact, you know, like when when Bill Clinton said, I did not have sex with that woman, mm-hmm. woman I think there was a kernel of truth to it <laughs> because he, because fellatio was uh-huh. alternative. Uh-huh. It was something else. Yeah. And just as there are uh, young women today who feel they are virgins if they have anal sex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've yeah, I've heard this too from men. It's, they say, "Oh, well, if it's a blowjob, it's it's not cheating on my wife." Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So there's that's Deep Throat. That's the basic uh, the storyline there. So what was it like for you? For me to go yeah. see it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um. Uh, a bunch of us graduate students at the University of Colorado. In your twenties. One of them was a philosophy professor, and his wife who was, I think, a graduate student, and my husband, and there were about six of us, I think. We just decided to make a long drive. It was like a 50-minute drive to go to Denver from Boulder. So it was an outing. Mm -hmm. And we went to, I think it was called the Pussycat Theater, so it wasn't your normal Mm -hmm. theater. It was a theater that was... 
of a porn theater, yeah. but porn theaters were not necessarily sleazy at this point. Mm-hmm. They were, you know, like Times Square right. sleazy, mm-hmm. the kind of thing that Andy Warhol would write about. Mm-hmm. This was more like upscale. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, meaning that you had to pay a little bit more for the tickets. Uh, it, it, I mean, it wasn't like, it w- the, there wasn't ejaculate all over the right. floor. And there were no men in trench coats, I take it. Right, exactly. And we were we were proof because we were right. young student types. Relatively wholesome, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. certainly thought I was a wholesome person. <laughs> but, but I was really up for the adventure of, okay. of seeing what what this film had to hold. Um, so I just have to say, I cannot imagine, you know, having spent 25 plus years in the Academy as a undergraduate, graduate student and professor, I can't imagine going to watch uh, porn with any fellow, with any colleagues and especially not people who are already, you know, tenured, ref, you know, who are already professors. I mean, I, I find it to be, as we were talking about before we started recording, mm-hmm. A possibly the most conservative and uptight and puritanical institution or culture in this country, academia. I find I find people to be profoundly repressed in ways that you don't find in the rest of the culture. Does that at all comport with your experience? Maybe not because you've been sort of no in, because you've been in the weirdo uh, departments though. I'm talking about like in history. I can tell you it's pretty buttoned down. Well, the the professor we went science. we we went with. Uh, I think he was the one who had the car. Okay. Um, this is also in the seventies. He was a philosopher. For, yeah, I know. This is, this is also he, in the seventies. He, he did lose tenure. <laughs> oh, see, I told you they ran them all out. <laughs> all the cool ones they got run out. Uh, okay. On the other hand, I got tenure. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> well, you got tenure before you started writing about porn. I do, I did. did you're right. This you're is right. very important. You, uh, I've heard yeah. you. I've heard you talk about this. Yes, and no. it's a very. You, you actually advise your students not to, to not to write about porn until they Although, get tenure. Although, uh, and, and I think I still do. Yeah, you should. I think I still do because because it can go so many different ways. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, did you at that point? Did you develop an interest in pornography in any way, either intellectually or just as a consumer? Uh, well, I was at that time, I was really interested in the phenomenon of sitting in a theater with other people where, where the goal of the film is to arouse you. And, and, and that's a phenomenon. Yeah. Another thing I've never done. I've never watched porn with a a group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I was just fascinated by that. Uh-huh. And I think that is the reason why, if you watch Deep Throat, it's got this one bad joke after another. Because the jokes were there to set you at ease. To, mm. to I mean, if you're not going to explode in an orgasm in the theater, mm-hmm. um, and you're probably not because you're with other people. I mean, that was the phenomenon of Deep Throat, that it wasn't the sleazy raincoat brigade, that it was, here we are, we're together in this theater and we're celebrating sex mm-hmm. in some okay. way. Um, and and the laughter was an easy way to make that celebration kind of more comfortable. Oh, so it really was, okay, so it really was perceived by you and probably by other people in the audience as... Most importantly, am I right, sort of a part of the sexual revolution, the counterculture. Precisely. And the liberatory um, potential of those things, In fact, in, things, in, right? in that film by your friends, Randy mm-hmm. and, and Fenton, Fenton yeah. um, uh, John the, Waters yeah. says, well, you might be sitting next to Angela Lansbury. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So, okay. So, so it was a social ex- uh-huh. experience th- that going to see Deep Throat and everybody did just for the experience. So it was a kind of, uh, how am I going to undergo this experience? A kind of experiment mm-hmm. on some level. Okay. Okay. Now this is what I want to ask you. So this is in 1972, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Okay. And you're in grad school and your interests, have they already turned toward cinema? Um, yes, they have. At that point. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you you don't work on porn, but for it's another... not seventy two. Because se- it, the film opened in New York, and it was probably seventy three. Okay, we're in the provinces, maybe seventy four. Okay. Right, but you don't write about pornography until nineteen eighty nine. No, I you don't. don't I don't dare you, do something like that. So you spend like more than a decade not even touching porn. You're, you're writing very academic studies of first French surrealist film. Right, and then film generally. Yes, but but look at the look at the films. Figures of Desire is the title of yes. your of your dissertation, which has become your first book, which we're looking at right now. Which, um, and so so that was your first work, and that was your focus, and your your um, I'd say orientation towards sex, sexuality, and pornography was quite different than wasn't it? Then in your later work, you've said this. And... Yes, but but I would say it was of a piece. It was something oh, that yeah. oh yeah led me to down this oh, primrose path towards pornography <laughs> primrose path toward <laughs> pornography <laughs> that's the subtitle of your memoir i think <laughs> um sure i see through lines immediately between mm-hmm. figures of desire which is your study of surrealism um uh with with your later work on pornography uh but there's a contradiction too because you've said and well it's there in figures of desire you you are applying a theory a freudian theory to film and Mm -hmm. to sexuality in film that is at the time was sort of de rigueur among feminist scholars right which is sort of the castration theory the fear of castration absolutely the the sexualized woman represents it's all there and and it it all worked perfectly yeah oh yeah too perfectly totally i'm sure (laughs) yeah and the same stuff you wrote about horror movies very similar right the the castration anxiety Mm -hmm. that essay you have Mm -hmm. right so can you just Tell people, you know, the theory, lay out the theory and the, how you applied it at that time, which well, you, yeah, which you right. no longer entirely yeah, subscribe it, it to. It was right? a Lacanian. I had mm-hmm. been to France. I had go, undergone uh, a conversion to Lacan, mm-hmm. who seemed to, seemed to have the the structural, the proper structuralist and also psychoanalytic understanding of the human subject. Mm. And the the idea is that the subject is not, you know, this coherent thing we think we are, reasonable, mm-hmm. uh, governed by rules, and but in fact we are we are these dispersed desires and and um, per- perverted mm. because perversion is not like a sickness. Perversion is the natural state of of desire in in our culture mm. where uh, mm. one is obliged to per- to literally what does perverse mean it means to slide away from the direct thing to a more indirect thing oh. and so fetishism is a perversion and right. fetishism is so rampant in yeah. surrealist cinema mm. um uh and what is fetishism according to freud and lacan it is it is the way of uh, not confronting the fact that uh, there is castration. It is it is uh, sliding off. Uh, that one becomes fascinated by the let's say the frilly underwear because the frilly underwear are the things that disguise the fact that if you looked at male and female bodies, you would see that the female is quote castrated lacking the penis which is lack which represents castration yeah a violent and, act. and and so we are all based on the idea of this theory was that we are all based on lack mm-hmm. and and men and women are or, or fear, are fear of the lacking. same way for men it would be the fear of the lo- fear losing the it. fear of losing what they have and women and, are driven by their yes, lack of a, i remember at penis. posing this question yes. to uh, Christian Metz, who was my professor in 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 Paris, when I, where I was learning all of this stuff, mm. and saying, are, are "You think it's really the same for men and women?" And he said, <laughs> "Je suis persuadé que, que sont les, that men and women are exactly the same. Really, in 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 this f- formation of their subject based on lack huh. and the desire to fill the lack." Yeah. And I bought it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and the feminist in me was a little. Uh, in fact, I think when I when I finally published a new edition of this book, at the end, I said, I said a little bit about an afterword in which you know I probably didn't do the proper feminist thing that I should have done by these 
by the oh. by these films because you know why are they slitting women's eyeballs a woman's eyeball at the beginning of Un Chien Andalou, which was the first really spectacular and powerful uh, uh, surrealist cinema mm-hmm. uh, surrealist film. If you remember, there's a moment where Louis Buñuel, who is sharpening a razor, uh, looks up at the sky and he sees a razor-thin cloud going across the moon. And he he's sharpening this razor as he does this. And then suddenly there's a woman who appears and he sh- pulls the razor across her eyeball. Mm. And... That was so shocking to me when I saw that in a classroom at Berkeley still when shocking. I was young. Yeah. It is still shocking. Sure. It's I mean because it's shocking because it's not just that a man pulls a razor across a woman's eye. That's shocking, but it's that's violence. Mm-hmm. But it's motivated by the by this kind of aesthetically beautiful movement of the cloud across the moon, Mm -hmm. which is analogous to the razor being pulled across the eye. And these are the figures, you know, this comparison of, and this is a classic surrealist uh, uh, figure Mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of metaphorical figure, uh, as you take something like an umbrella uh, and, and you compare it to, uh, a sewing machine, uh, or a, you take really, really disparate things and you compare them, mm-hmm. and that's the nature of the surrealist figure. Mm-hmm. So, I was excited by my ability to understand these figures of desire as being uh, examples of the des- desire to. Cast, to to castrate to enact castration, but then to uh, solve the castration with the fetish right. that, that that will never solve it. Okay. But yeah. but the, the, this is this is what the figures of desire do. They are endless figures of disrupting the unity of the subject and then trying to uh, like there, there's a moment at the end of Louis Buñuel's last film where a a woman is sewing a bloody piece piece of cloth or embroidering a, and it's all about opening and closing lack mm-hmm. and absence and so you know I really enjoyed it I thought I had solved the mystery of these films okay but I mean it, it comports very much with a lot of feminist analysis at the time though right which is, is absolutely yeah yeah because it's you're saying <laughs> yeah okay I wasn't sure about that the because it um the the woman the object of desire is desired in a fetish fetishistic way because she represents the castrated male the male fears being castrated so he looks at the at the woman the object of desire with dis- disdain disgust fear right is, am i getting it right mm-hmm. yeah um and that was but also desire and desire at the same time, which, so it's an endless loop, right, this right. endless sort of unhealthy, one might right. say, uh-huh. um, misogynistic, it ends up being, right, loop. Yes. Know, right? Okay. And that's the way that many feminists, not all, but many feminists, and I guess you, looked at porn originally. As, yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Oh, good. I thought, yeah. <laughs> I thought, yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah. to me, the transition you make mm-hmm. between mm-hmm. your early work yeah. on surrealism and your later work on pornography. Because you change that. I mean, but you, you sort of change your mind about that. I right? do. So you do You do eventually change your mind, and I want to get to that in a second, When you, once you get to writing about porn more than a de- decade later, right? Or about mm-hmm. a decade later. Um, but there's another thing in surrealist film that you were very interested in, or maybe you were less interested in this, but it's you would acknowledge that it's very much a part of it, which you call its subversion of rational bourgeois civilization, right? That's what you say in the book it was known for and that's sort of celebrated for and still is and i think that's we agree right that's still mm-hmm. it's very much a part of surrealism mm-hmm. um is sort of pointing to pointing to the absurdity of rational bourgeois civilization subverting it in very various ways showing how it's actually uh, damaging to people's bodies to people's psyches and all sorts of ways the rational the rationalism of bourgeois civilization which, you know, my work is all about that my work mm-hmm. is all about challenges to rational bourgeois mm-hmm. civilization um, now, were you, 
you want you you start with that in your analysis of surrealism and then say but i'm interested more in what goes on between men and women and this castration thing that happens but were you what was your take on rational bourgeois civilization at that time were you pro or con i was definitely con (laughs) you were con okay um but but you know i i I look back you know i'm (laughs) I'm <laughs> older and wiser now. I I I was in I was a revolutionary. I believed I was a revolutionary. Mm-hmm. I hadn't thought deeply about what revolution really meant. Ah. Um but I thought that um I thought that the surrealists were on the side of of disturbing all of the repressive factors in in uh, in, in bourgeois civilization and they were. Mm-hmm. But you know, I now think of it as very much a kind of masculine pose. Mm. Uh, I thought, you know, Bunuel and Dali were both deeply, deeply misogynistic, mm. and I was at that time in my in my thinking more on the side of the revolution than on the side of the women. Mm. And and it was always it was always the woman's eyeball that would be. Sp- Slit. Sliced, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and and I was I was kind of blind to that myself. Okay, at the time. Now this is so in the early seventies there were many revolutions going on, right? And my mm-hmm. parents were involved in just what we would call political a political revolution, sort of you know in terms of seizing control of the means of production and institutions yes. and yes. economics and public policy, mm-hmm. right? You were interested, sounds like maybe in that too, but. In a in different revolution, sort of the, what I would call the revolution of the counterculture of the '60s, right? Yes, and, and very much opposed to the war in Vietnam. Sure. And my husband was a, a draft resistor. Good man for that, by the way. One of the great anybody who resisted any draft is my hero. Right. Period. Um, but it seems like you were more interested in the cultural revolution that was going on. Yes, is that right? Yeah. Okay. And what what did you? S- I I thought they were the same thing. I was very oh. naive. <laughs> yeah, I think they're very different. And I think that actually many people who are on one side, who are, who are revolutionaries in one way, that we are tend to be actually, well, you know this very well, tend to be quite uh, reactionary mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to things like sexuality yes, and culture. Yes, right? yes. I mean, that's been my experience. Do you have another reference to a documentary? Have you seen the documentary Berkeley in the 60s? Oh, of course. Right. Yeah. My mother's in it briefly. I but. believe... I believe I'm in it too, but but yeah. I, you know, not sure. But I thought it was a great. I talk about this a lot. I think they do this great thing. Having grown up here during that time, uh, well, I was a kid, but later, um, of showing the difference between what was going on, sort of in a, in the counterculture in San Francisco, where it was you know the beat poets and the hippies and you know smoking weed and rolling in the grass in Golden Gate Park and dodging the draft, but mm-hmm. dodging the draft in order to basically enjoy yourself. Right. 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 Um, versus over here in Berkeley, mm-hmm. which where the serious people were doing serious political work, you know, opposing the war, right, fighting for civil rights, getting mar- getting arrested, seeking socialism, you know, yes. arguing about Marxism, doing that, you know, which that's those are my parents, right? Even mm-hmm. though they were interested mm-hmm. in this other stuff, but they really and they were sort of opposed. It wasn't just that they were um, right happened to be on the other sides of the bay, but they were actually hostile to each other. At least I think the serious politicos over mm-hmm. here were definitely hostile to the, what they saw as sort of the frivolous Allen Ginsbergs of the world, right? Mm-hmm. The, the frivolous. Yeah, we, we definitely experienced that too. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, huh. my husband was a Berkeley radical political, uh, but then there was the... Um, uh, what was it? Oh, I know. I, w- I went away and hitchhiked across Europe for uh, 1967. Uh, this was m- my my sentimental education. Mm-hmm. I just went off to Europe in order to experience the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I came back, it was it was uh, 1968, mm-hmm. and. My husband had become, he wasn't my husband then, he was my boyfriend. He became my boyfriend. He was a hippie. Mm-hmm. He had become a hippie from a okay. Berkeley political, oh. you know, radical okay. who had refused induction into the war. He transferred to San Francisco State and became a hippie. Oh, and wow. this was like, a, a, and I had kind of missed that transition uh-huh. because I was, 
uh, I was an au pair in Paris. I was trying to learn French. I was mm. um, trying to be serious. And then I came back here, and and the world had changed. Mm. And there was this song. I was hitchhiking across the United States to come home. If you're going to San Francisco, mm-hmm. you have to wear a flower in your in hair. hair. Yeah. I mean, what was that all about? <laughs> I had missed it, <laughs> but then I encountered it, and it was it was it was an explosion of touchy feely, you know, mm-hmm. hippy dippy kinds of things that were that were less serious. Yeah. But were definitely happening. They were, and they were about the body. All about the that's body. Right. Yes. And over that's here, true. we were about the mind. Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's to uh-huh. me a big difference between yeah. the two camps. Exactly. exactly. So you, but so you started. I take it you were attracted not only to him but to his new culture. I was. Okay. I was. And by the late sixties. And marijuana and all of those. Okay. Things, oh, so, which I had not been into before. And so, did you become a bit of a hippie yourself? Um, or were your allegiances there? More well, let with- me say that I, I, I'll tell you the answer to that. I participated in a, um, a sit-in. A good old fashioned nonviolent sit in mm-hmm. at the Oakland Induction Center. I think it was 68. Excellent. Uh, and we were beaten f- severely, mm. savagely by police. Mm. And, and um, this was, it became the Oakland, the Oakland Seven, I think was the yep. name of the. That's right. Uh, and I, and I, then I became a witness in that. In that trial, oh, really, and I was described as a mini-skirted co-ed, really, because <laughs> I was back at Berkeley, uh-huh. uh, but I wore a short skirt, and 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 I, in fact, somebody was just talking about this the other day. All women were dis- defined this way if they wore a mini skirt. You were, I was a mini-skirted co-ed, yeah, of course, which is very, very doubly gendered in oh, a way. Uh, sure, <laughs> yeah. And, but I was able to describe being beaten by police, and that was that was effective. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, that's also gendering you. I mean, that's you become then the victim. Yeah, yeah. the classic, and so, so, the classic female victim. Too. And so then, gradually, you know the. The double standards began to become apparent, mm. but they weren't immediately apparent. I was kind of slow to discover feminism. I, mm. I mean, I don't think I was really slow, but feminist psychoanalytic was my way of discovering feminism. Mm. And it was many years before I abandoned the psychoanalysis as, as, uh, as, as an intellectual tool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just thinking about you know the continuity again between your early earlier life and earlier career with again <laughs> your your obsession fascination with pornography, <laughs> um, and I I gotta think that your move at least tentatively toward the counterculture and at that moment mm-hmm. had to be you know something in you you know that makes sense that fits with someone who would be willing to break the taboo of studying porn seriously 20 years later, right? Does that make sense? I suppose. Okay. I don't, it, it never seemed audacious. It never seemed really deeply radical. It seemed like a natural thing to do for me. To, to study porn. And actually, I don't think I ever suffered any deep consequences yeah, either. Yeah, you've talked about that. So yeah, so Hardcore comes out in 89. And as I said, it was pretty much alone at that time. It was the first of its kind. I mean, yes... Paul Mark- Marcus is his first name. Paul uh, Steven, Stephen. Stephen Marcus. Stephen Marcus had written the book, but it wasn't really. A, I wouldn't call that a serious study the way that yours was. But um, you did not experience any backlash. Well, sure. Um, the so-called because at this point we are polarized. There mm. are the feminists who are uh, anti-pornography mm-hmm. and who have determined that the real problem. Oh yeah. In, let's situate this. Yeah. Let's okay. sorry. Let's do that. Let's do the porn wars. A lot of people don't know the history here. Okay. The late seventies, early eighties, that <clears> stuff. Because that's that's where you're, you're kind of just after that, right? You're not writing in the midst of that. You're no, I'm not. Post, I'm, it's after that. Post yeah. sec. Post porn wars. Okay. So uh, the porn. <clears throat> so people like Andre Dworkin, <clears throat> especially Andre Dworkin, mm-hmm. um, began to express their <clears throat> excuse me express their feminism and i think partly because it was hard to just sort of find what was the the the, the thing that needed to be attacked um instead of attacking hmm. 
inequality directly, which they did, mm -hmm. but it was so easy to find the scapegoat in, mm -hmm. in pornography. Mm -hmm. And so in the early stages of feminist development, mm -hmm. um, people like Robin Morgan. Morgan would say pornography is the theory, rape is the practice. practice yeah. Which, if you think about it, is just an insidious kind of way to put it. <laughs> yeah. uh, if rape is the practice, the theory is not pornography. The theory is, is, is misogyny. The theory is patriarchy. It's but but right. pornography is just an easy target, mm -hmm. a very easy target. Um, and uh, so it was in the midst of those kinds of theories, which were happening on college campuses and uh, which I was certainly aware of, uh, that uh, and I, which I believed were true. Mm -hmm. I actually thought, yeah, oh, okay, sure, pornography is bad. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I had gone to see, I had gone to see Deep Throat, but I didn't think it was bad. I didn't think it was especially good. I just thought it was interesting. You weren't, you weren't offended. I wasn't offended. Oh. Um, okay. Uh, and there was this film called Not a Love Story, which you may have oh, this, ever seen. Oh, it's a documentary, right? A documentary. About pornography, which about is anti-porn. About pornography. Porn, very right. anti-porn documentary. It's like, no, duh, it's not a love story. That's the point. Right. right? <laughs> which and you I, have said, yes. And I saw it. <laughs> I, I saw this film and I thought, oh, this, I guess this is true. But I, I didn't think about it okay. very deeply. Um, okay. But I, you know, I was a good feminist and, you know, so, so I thought I should be anti-pornography. Okay. And uh, when did I actually change? Were you aware of the, the handful of sex positive feminists at that time who were challenging this stuff? People well, that... well, I wasn't exactly in the thick of it because... Um, People like Ellen Willis, who's a hero of mine. I wasn't a lesbian. The fact ah. that I wasn't a lesbian made it harder for me to, um, I would say, immediately take sides because it, it was quite clear that the, a split was happening uh, between, at that time, lesbian. You wouldn't have called them queer mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. activists. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did have friends who were, who, who were, who were lesbian activists. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I, I remember. I, I'm sorry, I cannot remember the sequence of events, but there was this conference at Barnard that mm. was oh very famous in 1982. On this is like the first academic right, conference right. on porn, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Right in 1982. And it and, and it split. Yep. That's when that's when the fights sort of right. congealed. I guess. And I yeah. wasn't part of that. Not okay. not being. Uh, a, a sexual minority myself at that time. Mm. Um, I was. I think I was on the sidelines. Okay. Um, but I certainly had. But lesbians tended to be during that fight anti-porn. Is that what you're saying? Mm, I'm not sure. Okay. I think this the split actually took place because lesbians wanted well, to express an alternative sexuality. Right. And there was a period, and here I'm probably conflating my memory of what happened with my notion of what the pornography was doing because mm -hmm. lesbians did start to make, make pornography their own, make their own pornography right and it was it tended to be kind of boring pornography and it was, erotic it was in nature erotic. <laughs> was erotic in nature <laughs> right. you know where you know you would have pretty female bodies and Lots of trees and, and <laughs> like that. blue skies. Yeah. Um, uh, but I should have a better chronology. Uh, eventually, though, um, when I decided to write about pornography, and I wrote about, I think I decided to write about pornography with some of the same, uh, uh, I'll show you enthusiasm. It, I'm, I'm, that I had when I said I'm going to write on film to my to my uh, advisors when I was in Colorado. Uh, in this case, I thought, well, wouldn't this be interesting? If what, what what did I? 
I'm try, I can't actually remember what first intrigued me about it. Hmm. You said, you do say, you admit in the 1999 edition of Hardcore that you had a, quote, prurient interest in it. Yeah, I would never have said that earlier. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you, you, that could because you admit that, yeah. No, no, uh, you know, definitely I knew that pornography and that, that I also later on write about Last Tango in Paris, that that was, that, that, that was a real turn on for me. And now mm. it's politically incorrect mm. to be turned on by, once again, okay. <laughs> um, because Maria Schneider was, was apparently uh, abused mm -hmm. in, in that um, by Marlon Brando, uh, right? Well, and also or, by the director Bernardo oh, Bertolucci. Okay, right. N not not in the sense of sexually abused, but psych psychically mm -hmm. abused. Mm -hmm. In they they sprung things on her that she wasn't prepared for. Right. And uh, and there's a famous sex scene in it that's right that yeah. pushed the envelope in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. So you're like we're, we're in the 80s, so it's post. Oh, okay. So we're I post think... porn wars. But feminists sort of split over this, right? right so the right. the more dominant anti-porn feminists like Andrew mm -hmm. Dwork and Catherine McKinnon become famous and they pass some ordinances that censor porn, which become overturned by the Supreme Court. But meanwhile, they are coming up against this new generation of then called sex positive feminists. People like Ellen Willis, right. like hero of mine. And, yeah, uh, mine too. Yeah, yeah, many others, you know, in the younger generation, Laura Kipnis, who was later, but mm -hmm. um, and others uh, and you. Um, who's had different, very different takes on porn and sexuality and women's sexuality. And, um, so I, I think I, I'm trying to, so that, so I so, arrive at this yeah. by, become, I become, I become a self-proclaimed feminist mm -hmm. and a psychoanalytic feminist, but I, be, I begin writing about, and this is partly because I'm, I'm no longer able to do any of the avant-garde things that I wanted to do because I am in an English department. Oh, okay. And in an English department, I have to do English things. So I start doing American film. Mm. Uh, I mean, you couldn't study your French surrealism anymore. I couldn't. Right. I could never Because you're now even, in an English department. I could never even teach it. Yeah. Uh, and that and was your first so love. I, I, that was yeah. my first love. But I'm actually really grateful okay. that I got away from that kind of avant-garde uh, sensibility uh, which thought that to be avant-garde was to be anti-bourgeois and was to solve all of the all of the political problems were automatically solved if you were avant-garde mm. um, and I've come to really uh, s be suspicious of that attitude mm -hmm. a and partly I think it was an accident that I was in an English department I had to teach American film and I began looking at the fem a feminist perspective on American cinema right. and that was when I discovered so called women's films right. and women's films were these films in which women suffered uh, maternal melodramas mm. romances but women would always suffer. Mm. They weren't the comedies at all. Mm -hmm. And I, I wrote an article that to me was very important on Stella Dallas, which was uh, a 1937 uh, melodrama about a suffering mother who sacrifices everything for her child and who ironically says at one point in her career, a woman wants to be something else besides a mother. At this point, I was pregnant. <laughs> I was teaching this film, and I was—I want—I definitely wanted to be something else besides a mother. But the the trajectory of that woman's narrative is that she, uh, Stella Dallas, is that ultimately she only wants to be a mother, and mm. she and she, the only way she can be a good mother is to pretend to disown her daughter. And so she ends up with nothing mm. except noble sacrifice. Mm. And these sacrifices became a, a theme that I was fascinated by in the so-called women's films in which women are sacrificing. And so this was my, my way to discover feminism mm -hmm. and to explore feminism in the context of the melodramas of American cinema, which is still something that I'm... I'm struggling with today and which is, but I've discovered that melodrama is something 
much broader than I thought. Yeah. That it is, in fact, the kind of the glue of, a, of, of, of popular culture. Yeah, you've made me three... Th- <laughs> yeah, you, melodrama, in some ways, might be the, one of the overarching themes in all of your work. Or much of your work. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I, I now see that. Yeah, yeah. And you made me rethink melodrama when I was reading your stuff again about race, which we'll talk about in mm-hmm. a second. Your more recent right. stuff on race. Right. Um, but um, so, but your reading of those women's films. So these are films that were popular among women and targeted at women audiences. I was, I, actually, I think I was trying to understand why my mother ah. would go cry at a movie uh, in which... A woman would sacrifice and suffer. Ah, okay. And, and what era? We're talking sort of early, mid 20th century? I was pregnant. No, no, no. The uh, films. The oh, films my, are popular. These 30s. 30s films. 30s. Oh, it's a 30s uh-huh. genre. Because I think of the... Th- oh, okay. This is... Is this post-code? And 40s. Oh, so it's post-code. Motion picture code. Absolutely oh, post-code. Oh, I see. Because before yeah. the code, you have the uh, fallen woman genre, which yeah, is yeah. the opposite. Yeah, A whole different thing. That's yeah. the cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Those are the badass women. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, these are the, these are the, the noble, I, sacrificing so, women. Okay, so the motion picture production code comes into effect in 1934. Yes, and I guess, really effective. And I didn't yeah. know this about... Um, and so they cleaned up everything. There were no more gangster films celebrating gangsters. There were no mm-hmm. more fallen women films celebrating right. the the woman who kills her husband and takes mm-hmm. his money mm-hmm. and has sex with many women, many women, men and women, <laughs> and travels the world and is a you know now we would call them a badass, right? Right. Um, right. Gets replaced by you know clean cut wholesome mm-hmm. Americans doing clean cut wholesome Housewives things. Housewives. So, but suffering. I didn't know about this sort of this women's film genre. You're saying it's a whole genre, I guess, during that period. Absolutely. Oh, I, yeah. Okay. No, it's very very popular. Oh, I guess since I wasn't. Marianne told. Doan has a wonderful book on it. Oh, okay. And so your mother was a fan of these. Yes, and, and she, my mother and I used to stay up and watch the movies uh-huh. uh, at, at and, late night television. And she would cry, and you wouldn't. No, no, we would cry together. <laughs> okay, we would good. cry together. Oh, okay. I wanted to understand that, but I yeah. wanted to differentiate myself yeah. as a feminist from my mother's generation. Okay, and then so how do you explain why she cried and why she cared so much about these films? Uh, because, because the suffering of a victim is crucial to the narrative it is the way sympathy is generated mm-hmm. um uh i mean to this day if you if you suffer you earn mm. my sympathy mm. even though you haven't done anything but suffer mm. i mean it's not like you're heroic i right. mean you just suffer that's right but there's this moral uh moral yeah. credit that is yes. given to suffering yeah which is i think uh that is why Trump can today proclaim that he is the victim of mm. of, of a democratic hoax. Okay, um, because he is he is saying he's claiming there's this vying to be the victim. Sure, that takes place in our culture. Sure, which is hugely important, and um, which is what gives a kind of and which is why melodrama is a moral genre and, and, and in fact it's no longer even a genre it is so pervasive in our culture mm-hmm. but i'm getting ahead of myself mm-hmm. this is what i'm working on now define melodrama though because it is in all your it's in much of your work yes um uh, it is a story in which uh someone suffers wrongly and uh one can say that it is wrong and it needs to be rectified and that the person who who either the person who suffers or the person who tries to rectify the suffering has earned the ability to uh seek vengeance it's mm-hmm. rambo mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. rambo suffers mm-hmm. and then he's able to refight the entire vietnam war He's entitled to because he has suffered mm-hmm. so much. Mm-hmm. And it is, it is this hypocritical, deeply American, but not only American, belief that to suffer is to, is to earn moral validity. Yeah, and virtue. You, one becomes virtuous by their suffering, exactly. by being a victim. Right. Well, it's interesting that you, that, you, that you cite Donald Trump, Rambo, and then... The sub the the characters in these women's films of the 30s and 40s, but most people talk nowadays. You know, they call, talk about the culture of victimhood these days, and it's usually we're talking about what goes on in 
college campuses actually right that that yes a whole new cast has been given triggers this. yes so triggers and this this brings us to your later work which is not about <clears throat> pornography or much of it isn't you know which is about race in film and mm -hmm. television mm -hmm. you've written about race in film and race in television in particular the wire you have a whole book on that uh but so um so t tell us about i mean talk about that like what's you see you see at least as i read you um the the way that the relations between blacks and whites in this country historically have been presented is through melodrama. And originally it was the white victims and the black rapists, right? With No, with, ori originally, where do, where do oh. we start? That it, it, it matters but, where you start. Before Birth of a Nation? What is there before Birth of a Nation? Uncle Tom. Oh, 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 okay, right, of Uncle course. Uncle Tom in, is in, the original black I was thinking victim. film. I was thinking film, but yes, okay, so right. The no, not, but but Uncle sure. Tom, there are many film versions of Uncle Tom. Absolutely. But it was, uh, at that point, That's right. Uncle Tom was past its prime as a novel. That's right. Uh, and f uh, it had really done its major work. Yeah, your use of the Tom figure. On stage. Is cr is so huge, the more I think about it. Yeah, and that's what your your book on race is. So you playing the race card is the book. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's sort of the what you you show how the Tom figure has been used and refigured in all sorts of ways. So the talk about the original Uncle Tom and who he was. I mean, sort of the pure victim, the innocent, virtuous victim, mm -hmm. right? Right. I mean, just just some people okay. actually don't know the story. Yes, so, I know. Yeah. No, and we're not supposed to because really? to talk about oh, because it's un politically Uncle Tom is, po is so politically right. incorrect, well, it's, it's a, which is so why important. it's important it's to so important. recognize that. And yeah. of course, black people don't want to say that they in any way identify mm -hmm. with Uncle Tom because it's yeah. become such a. Right. And James Baldwin had talks about crying at uncle he is a wonderful essay oh, yeah? and he talks about crying at uncle tom and and mm. that the, the 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 fact that he shouldn't cry at uncle tom but um oh, i should read that uh, yeah wow I, I can't remember the name but yeah. of the of feeling the essay feeling ashamed what, mm -hmm. what was he ashamed of do you remember what was baldwin ashamed of Ashamed of identifying with identifying time? with victimhood if when I, you yes. when you when you need to identify with the strength yeah. that can fight Whitey. That's right. Um, right. So Tom in the original. Well, Tom in the original is in the the original being the novel. Yes. Now you know I don't believe that uh, there was a, a, an uncle. To, I mean, there are many Uncle Tom figures. Um, Harry Beecher Stowe just happened to write this novel that. Um, was trying to oppose the Fugitive Slave Act, mm -hmm. and which saw the fugitive slaves as honorable people trying to save themselves, trying to escape from uh, from suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Uncle Tom uh, became a kind of amalgam figure for her, but he was the good slave mm -hmm. in the sense that he didn't run. Uncle Tom's mistake was not to run. Mm -hmm. Eliza, I mean, so she splits this narrative into the fugitive slave as a woman who does run because she's got a child and she heroically crosses the Ohio River on ice flows mm -hmm. with the dogs and the slave catchers behind her. Um, so you have Uncle Tom, pure victim, gets sold down river and suffers and suffers and suffers and is finally beaten to death. Whereas you have the other story, which is Eliza escaping the the mulatta, mm -hmm. actually, who can actually pass for white. Uh, and so it's a, it's a story that goes deep into the south and towards the north, but ironically, nowhere for black people to achieve freedom. <laughs> right. Uh, well, Stowe didn't get there because what happens to Eliza? Well, and what, could Lincoln even imagine that? No, he yeah. he was toying with the idea of going back to Africa. Right. Right. Or, uh, so it, it's a total mess, but <laughs> it it captures the imagination of the entire country, especially the North, mm -hmm. especially the white people in the North who identify with the South that they never even knew, mm -hmm. but sing the songs. I grew up singing Swanee River mm -hmm. and Old Folks at Home. I mean, 
I, 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 I think I was learning to play them on the guitar. Um, and this is, you know, this Stephen Foster. The, this uh, is Blackface Minstrels you were talking about. Exactly. Yeah, which I've written a lot about. Yes, yes. exactly. became the most popular art, popular art form in America for a decade, the for a century. First, for a century. The fir- not only the most important, but yeah. the first popular art That's form right. in American yeah. culture. Beginning really in the 1820s. There's evidence that it starts in the 1820s, that early. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, so that's the story of Uncle Tom. Yeah. It has many manifestations it it gets played all over the united states as theater it becomes song but importantly tom is a sympathetic figure the right? sympathetic he, he's the black man black, yes. sim, he's the first sympathetic black man for white people right? because they'd been figures of fun uh, or of you know if there were slave uprisings they could be figures of danger yep. um so this sympathy and this is you know this is mid 19th century mm-hmm. uh uh, culture of sympathy, where when melodrama is really, really mm. in at its height mm. and and recognized as such. Melodrama is also Manichaean, right? There's villains Completely. and there, heroes. There, there is good only... and evil, and that's that, mm-hmm. right? Okay. And and, when and for the... the first time, black people are on the good side. They're on the they're on the side of the angels as in, opposed in as opposed to figures of fun, right? Deri- yes. Derision or yes. fear. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so this is a, a sea change in in American sympathy. It is the sea change that leads to the possibility of the Civil War. Yep. Uh, when Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe. It's the template, I think, for our racial politics today. Yeah, I, I think so, too. Well, that's, that's the argument in your book, as a matter of fact. But I, 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 <laughs> well, I'm glad you agree. <laughs> I had, I, that was my theory. I had come to it in a different way than you did when, before I'd read your book. But when I read it, I thought, oh, God, she nails this. Yes. <laughs> um, but, but then Tom gets refigured and, and sort of flipped in some ways. Uh, yes. And reversed yes. in various ways through the 19th and 20th century all the way, because your book goes all the way up until like, the 1990s or even later. Uh, right? you look uh, at roots. Roots. roots oh, to the 70s. Uh, the 70s right? I, I try to look at only those moments where there are changes in, in sympathy right. uh, and, and uh, big changes in terms of media. So mm-hmm. I'm, I, I look at the novel. I look at theater and that was the tom era right um uh, and then film and that with film the arrival of film you begin this transition towards another great big popular american melodrama of black and white which is birth of a nation which Mm. does reverse i mean literally reverse in fact Thomas Dixon, who wrote the novels upon which this film was based, mm-hmm. um, originally was writing a a parodic sequel of Uncle Tom, in which he just oh no kidding yeah it was like the 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 uh, children of of Eli- Eliza's son uh-huh. who goes to freedom uh, who who achieves freedom uh, uh, wants to marry a white woman. And is refused by, you know, it's, these are the, the political fantasies of, of Thomas Dixon. But he, he thought he was continuing the story in a way that reversed it. Mm-hmm. And he did. Because he's no longer I mean, sympathetic. By the t- right. By right, the right. time you get to... He's now a rapist or a potential rapist. He, he's a rapist. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, how did this happen? It's, this is the story of American history and Reconstruction era sort of... Not fa- not ama- not managing to reconstruct mm-hmm. race mm-hmm. <laughs> in American culture, mm-hmm. and um, uh, so films film becomes the m- new medium that is capable of making people feel strongly against black people, mm-hmm. and so racism it, it just it goes back and forth. We get sympathetic and 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 and. and antipathy uh-huh, <laughs> racial antipathy uh-huh, yeah. uh and it's it's a very sad story yeah well i mean but that's not the end of it so birth of a nation was in 1914 right i believe 1915 15 came out okay and but you you finish as you said with roots which was oh my gosh possibly the most important <sighs> certainly television show or movie that i saw as a child that came out in 77 1977 I think so, 76 or 77. Boy, I have I'm, forgotten. I'm, I'm 90% sure it's one of the two. But it was a, 
multi-part series on television that I think it was the most viewed TV show ever. It was. At that I point. Mean, restaurants did Everybody. not serve food. Everyone stopped to watch. Yeah, it. and I was in sixth grade uh-huh. in Berkeley in uh, Columbus Middle School, mm-hmm. and all the kids were talking about it. Yeah, and some of the kids started chanting "Roots." Um, once and a lot of us white kids took it as a threat <laughs> as a matter of really fact. oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> there was um you know we were the first generation to be uh, bust you know involuntarily uh-huh, uh-huh. and so there was a massive social engineering project in the city and i was the very first i was bust in kindergarten uh-huh. I was, and that was the very first uh, group of children in the entire country who were bust um you know, it had its benefits, but it also was a nightmare for a lot of us. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, there was a whole lot of conflict between blacks and white, black kids and white kids. A lot of violent that never gets talked about. And unfortunately, the oppressed in those situations tended to be the white kids. So, um, but this is sort of a digression. Uh, you talk about um, Roots as flipping it again. Right. So Alex Haley writes the book Roots, which I read, by the way, under the covers with a flashlight, um, that, which is a giant novel. That yeah, I'm, very, really fat novel. Very important thing. Like for me. Uncle Tom, like so Gun with the Wind, all of these big. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally engrossing. Yeah. And I began my fascination with black culture and black history at that time. When with, I was, with Roots. With Roots. No kidding. Roots and living in a mostly black neighborhood and uh-huh. the music of the time. But mm-hmm. Roots was really important. So this is the book came out earlier. So this would have been the mid 70s for me. Mm-hmm. But you you talk about Roots as uh, using the Tom figure very differently. Right, Alex. Yes, said. yeah. What, 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 I'm interested in now the transition to television, mm-hmm. a, a, a different mass medium, mm-hmm. but a mass medium that did really change the way people thought. Mm-hmm. And and um, Kunta Kinte as the hero, mm-hmm. who, who I mean, it, it's like a a, re, a remediation, a remedial fixing of the Tom story. Mm-hmm. So Kunta Kinte is a warrior. Uh, he is able to, um, he, he tries to escape uh, uh, being captured uh, and he, you know, he gets enslaved. But generationally over time, and this is the kind of seriality of the beginning seriality of, of, of melodrama, mm-hmm. not that melodramas had not been serial before, but of the melodrama of black and white. The story gets told in a way that can redeem the Tom figure. But but Kunta Kinte is heroic, although he loses, he's castrated, you know, by losing his, his foot. foot yeah. um, he can't run anymore. But over time, there's this kind of hopeful regeneration of black pride mm-hmm. and power and the endurance of the family and it was it was a book you know it was kind of a bogus book in a lot of ways because it was not it was made up <laughs> not the true story <laughs> yeah. that that he supposedly was telling mm-hmm. but but nevertheless it was it was for its time a way of post civil rights indicating um, the possibility of of uh, dignity and hope for the family, the black family, and freedom, and freedom, yeah. yeah, yeah, led by men who could have been Toms because they were the you know the, the subject of you know tremendous. I mean, Kunta Kinte has his foot cut off. They're all whipped. The women are raped. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. but generation after generation of this family rises. Right. gradually and ends and culminates in birthing Alex Haley, who's a member of this family, right? right. At least allegedly, who becomes uh, Malcolm X's, you know, uh, biographer uh-huh. and he is in the Coast Guard and he writes this, he writes the most famous and important book. And, right. And, you know, and, and very most... importantly, the, the beginning of the serialized television show begins with, with Alex Haley right. telling the story. A black man. He is the... The, the de- success, the descendant of would-be Toms, of men who could have been Toms, but but but, but chose not to. But be. the descendant of Kunta Kinte, Kunta Kinte, who was the who African, o- who overcame his his Tom status. He could right. have been a Tom. And right. who played Kunta Kinte's um, uh, uncle or noble uncle in in the film, in yeah. the the TV show? 
Uh, who gave a, a glorious I don't know. run. You don't remember. I, I can guess. O.J. Simpson. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here we go. So, yeah, this is, and you write about the O.J. Simpson trial too, <laughs> don't you? As part of the melodrama of, of the, black and white. As the enduring melodrama. Yes. Right? Yes. Between black and white in this country. Yeah. And that's how, God, you're, you're so right about that. It is just, it's a nonstop melodrama, if you look, I think. Mm-hmm. And it mm-hmm. continues. And mm-hmm. it's maybe more melodramatic today, today than it ever has been. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, how do, how do you, what do you make of sort of the recent upsurge of, you know, well, I mean, activism among black students around race on campuses? I mean, do you see it as a, a part of this tradition of melodrama, being melodramatic? I do. Well, I think it will be considered an insult if I if I yes, it if, would. If, I'm asking you a really dangerous question. Yeah. but you have tenure, so you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I do think that, uh, but uh, I think melodrama is also a force. It is a, mm-hmm. a powerful force in the culture, mm-hmm. and and it, it's a bit of a bind because if you can't portray yourself as a victim then the only other option you have is to be full of rage and, and, and violent. Hmm. Um, and the, there is this moral authority that comes from mm-hmm. uh, having been victimized. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I mean, it's not really powerful amongst black students on campuses. It's not the only thing that they can do. Mm-hmm. But... but um, yeah, I am worried about the the culture of victimization that that uh, prevails, mm. and um, uh, I, I worry about it especially in the classroom mm-hmm. when students say that they don't want to be exposed to things because mm-hmm. they might hurt them or they might trigger right. reactions that that. And then, and if that is the case, then I'm afraid. Then none of your books will be assigned. Education in is <laughs> education around any of the sensitive topics that we yeah. need to talk about yeah. becomes foreclosed, mm-hmm. and I think that's really unfortunate. I agree with you, and that's why I think I'm glad I'm not teaching right now because I would probably not be able to teach what I would want to teach. I wonder about that. Yeah, I wonder if you. Could. I don't think your books would go over too well these days mm-hmm. right uh that's a great ending but i'm not done with you i do have another question that's maybe a little bit off here but, but you can do it in the editing right no no <laughs> it's fine this is an organic podcast okay. we just flow here. Oh, okay no i mean so I, but it does kind of tie it all together so it's a good ending i think as well which is um you so you've written about uh you've written about porn pornography and you've written about race and you've written about race in pornography and you have some Mm. arguments that you've made on that uh i'm not super sure i'm in agreement with you here um Mm -hmm. but lay them out like what you've well i haven't really written about i mean i i have Uh, i have like one article that's that talks about race in well you edited you edited the volume that's about this right or much of it is about this, about race and porn. It's, there's, a whole, there's, sex, there's a whole section, yeah, at least, right? Okay. And, you, and you have an yes, essay in it. Yes, there is. Yeah. You have a whole essay in it, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, just talk about it. I mean, what uh, what do you see going on there? Well, what I initially noticed was that uh, pornographers like to portray themselves as liberal. And mm. because they like to portray themselves as liberal, they like to say that they are... They don't, you know, what's the liberal position in America on race that you don't pay attention right. to it? Colorblind. We are colorblind. Right. Um, I have a friend who says that colorblind is, does not exist, but color mute definitely yeah. exists. Yeah. And so... Meaning you know, we don't it, talk about it. We that, don't talk that's about That's to me what liberals do. They see it all the time. Right. They're obsessed with they it. don't talk about it. But they don't it. talk about it. Right. They don't talk about their own feelings about right. it. Right. Yeah. And, and so uh, I just discovered this, I think it was called something about the color line um and it was this porn film uh, mm. in which it, it was pseudo you know in the new form of pseudo documentary mm-hmm. where you would porn performers would be interviewed and they would say the 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 approved liberal thing i look at the person i don't look at the color right. and then you see them acting in a scene in which it's all about put your black cock up my 
white ass yep. or something like that. Yep, yep. And I love your black cock. And my God, your black cock is so big. Unlike my husband's white cock, right? Yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's nothing but pointing out the differences. And so yeah. I was just fascinated by the contradictions, you know, which is well, natural. Uh-huh. I mean, yeah. it, 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 you just got... The... I mean, to me, they're saying when they're acting what liberals are thinking but not saying. Mm-hmm. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? I mean, yes. It's just yes. it's yes. the return of the repressed. Yeah, there. it yeah. is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, I did have a section of that anthology, which I edited, which just opened up the discussion of um, sexualized and racialized desires. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, uh, the you know, it, it, it opened up a discussion that had not been taking place right. that I was pleased to Again, see. Again, you, you made this serious, a serious uh, yeah. thing to study. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I don't think, I don't have any solutions to it. Okay. Well, I'm not, I don't want solutions to it. I, I don't think there's a problem <laughs> with it. I mean, I think that, um, I think that there... I mean, to me, pornography is is amazing in a few ways. One of them is that it's just uh, democratic is not the right word. No, but it speaks the truth in, in ways that are often surprising. Well, Anna, Anna Aerosmith, who's been on my show, she's a feminist pornographer uh-huh. from the UK. You know, this is her thing. This is her argument. I just think it's brilliant. You know, it's she says, pick the thing that you hate the most about your body. And then go to Pornhub and you'll find a category yeah. that celebrates that yeah, very yeah, thing. Yeah, and yeah. you'll find thousands <laughs> or millions of people who, who love that thing more than anything else, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> so that means there's there's a place for everyone in there, right? Um, to even feel good about themselves. That's quite something. But I think on race, I mean, there's just far more interracial relations in porn than there are in the society at large we live in right now yes much of it of course you know is fetishization fetishization the... plays on the old black stud stereotypes right you know all mm-hmm. that sure no mm-hmm. doubt about it but then again i mean you know the black man having sex with a white woman is the oldest and gravest taboo that they just violate right and left mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and i think that alone is I think progressive, isn't it? I mean, I think just just having that and celebrating it and putting it right in your face is. I mean, it's certainly in certain contexts, it's, yes, it, but in other contexts, it okay. could be absolutely regressive. Okay, how so? Well, if you have a, an audience of mm. of white racists who mm. who uh, just see their own validation mm. of of their stereotypes in 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 the representation. Then, then if that that well, would be the context that would be regressive. But hang on now. I mean, so Deep Throat, as you said, was all about being concerned. The problem in Deep Throat was, you know, women's sex, women's inability to climax, to have an orgasm, right? And in other words, the problem was women's desire. Yes. Right. And there was an attempt to at least find a way to please women. I mean, it was silly and absurd and all that. Which happened to please men. <laughs> Certainly. No doubt about it. But Through this new newly invented form of fellatio <laughs> but but you know i porn in the last 10 to 20 years gonzo forms like what john stagliano yeah, has yeah, done right yeah. i mean that's what he's been most interested in is like women's desire women's pleasure women's orgasm in interracial porn it's the women desiring the black man that's what's going on that to me was by the way when when i when i teach the history of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s when it was six million members strong, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. That was the heyday of the Klan. If you read their literature, you read their, their discourse, it's very clear that that's what they were primarily afraid of. Of course. Women's yeah. desire yeah. for black yeah. men, for Italian men, for Jewish men, uh-huh. for dancing mm-hmm. in jazz clubs, mm-hmm. right? For intermixing sexually. And so in porn where there's interracial, interracial sex, I mean, I think it's almost always the woman has a special desire for black men in this whole new cuckold genre in mm-hmm. porn right which mm-hmm. is, that's exactly what it is you even have the the male the white man husband sitting there watching mm-hmm. while the wife is doing what she'd rather do which is yes. be with a black yeah. man yeah so i can't think of anything in american history taken as a whole <laughs> that would be more subversive i see okay uh, oh, is that okay all right? no i i accept that <laughs> oh good I accept that <laughs> okay good good that'll be your next book maybe well this has been a great pleasure. 
Me too. And I really, I think I'm just so grateful for this. And uh, I told you before this that academics are very skittish, uh, generally. But you have not been at all. You've been, you've been very uh, forthcoming and open and honest and a great unregistered guest. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right. Cool. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To become a member of Renegade University, go to renegadeuniversity.com. And to get more info and to buy tickets for the upcoming Renegade University weekend in Oakland and San Francisco with me and Daniel Coffeen, go to renegadeuniversity.com slash live. Thanks for listening.